think about when you hear the word Bible. Uh, to many of us, uh, maybe what you think about is this book that is ancient that I can't quite understand. Maybe some of you have tried to read it, and you know, all the V's and the vowels, whatever version you may have had, seemed like it was hard to understand. Maybe for some of you, you've seen actually the Bible on the bookshelves at any bookstore, even at Walmart, and you see it that it's made with, you know, this cheap plastic cover and really thin pages, and you don't know why everybody's selling it and why everybody talks about it. For some of you, you know, you, you grew up with it, and you know that it's good to read it, but every time you try, you just can't seem to, you know, make headway. Maybe some of the questions that we have when we hear the word Bible are questions like, where did it come from? You know, did it fall from heaven? Did God dictate to the writers of the scripture? You know, who put it together? Today we're going to talk about the Bible and why we hold it as our highest authority here at Harvester. And so I want to start talking about this by asking you a question. What is the source of your authority? What's the source of your authority? When it comes to how you live life, what is it that you hold as authoritative in your life? Because there are many things that you can hold, like your family. Maybe for you, you know, what your parents said about something, you know, it's kind of what you hold dear. It's like, hey, this is kind of my folks did it, and that's the way we're doing it. Maybe for you it's tradition. It's like, here's how people have been doing it, and here's how our families have been doing it, and that's, that's how we do it. For, for some of us in our culture, it's majority, right? We, we have a thing about majority in America, right? We call it democracy, and we think... You know, whatever the majority says, that's what must be best. And so we select our government that way, and which is not bad, it's great, and also the laws. So as people change, the laws and the government changes as well. In the past, the way that people gain authority was by strength. It's if you're a strong fighter, it's like you, you kind of, you know, went up the ranks, and all of a sudden you might find, find yourself, you know, being a general and having authority over other, others. Or maybe the way that we do it now is if you are good at speaking, if you are likable, if you like you know, politics and you're good at it, you may find yourself a leader. Now, the most popular probably by far is this, that our authority comes from within. It's like you don't need to go outside, just look from within. Whatever feels good, you know, those desires that you have, they must be there for a reason. And that's honestly what our society believes but I want you to know that for followers of Jesus, our authority comes from this book, from the Bible, from the, what we call the Word of God. And here's what we believe at Harvester. We believe the Bible is the inspired Word of God and absolute in its authority. We believe the Bible is the inspired Word of God and absolute in its authority. Now, if I asked you right now, do you believe that, you would say... Those of you who are awake would say, yeah. okay, there we go. And, and then we would, we would just kind of move on, right? But here's something that we need to recognize. With our heads, most of us, I think, would say yes. And, and some of us would be like, you know, I have some actual honest questions. That's fine. Uh, but with our hearts, I can tell you that we many times don't believe that because you know, we say yes. In fact, many of us like the verse of the week. You know, you kind of share. If someone sends you a verse on Facebook, you're like, yeah, let's share it. Why not? Uh, but, but that's all you know about Scripture. It's like you just know verses here and there. And we treat the Scripture like pills. You know, it's like, oh, man, I have a little bit of anxiety today. Like, I need my verse of the day. I feel a little better, right? And that's it. But you, if, if that's you, you're just treating symptoms, let me tell you. You're not treating the issue. And, and that's not how we work with, uh, with the Bible. That's not how we should work. Now, our instincts are right. It's like we know that this book has something to offer, but it's not the, the right thing to do. The execution is not what we need to do. It's like, you know, when my kids were little, you give them a hammer, and they know it's a tool, and then they start using the hammer to dig on the dirt, right? It's like the instincts are right, but the execution is not the way that it should be. And that's what happens when we come to Scripture that way. And so here's what I want you to to do. We're going to talk about three things that I want you to know about Scripture, we believe about Scripture, and then three practical just uh, steps to take. Here's the first one. We believe the Bible originates in God. Second Peter 1, 20 through 21 says this. 
if you want to go to that verse, thank you. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will. But prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. The Bible in the Old Testament and the New Testament considers itself as God's Word, as a revelation of, the, of God, as a revelation of, of the God of creation. And there's something unique about the Bible. Here's a few unique things about the Bible. The Bible really isn't a book. It's a collection of books. In fact, the word Bible or Biblias means library. It's a collection of, of different books. In fact, there are 66 of them in the Protestant Bible and 40 from 40 different authors. So here's one thing that's unique about the Bible. You know, sometimes people compare it to the Book of Mormon or to the Quran. Uh, Quran. Here's something that's different. Both of those books and really any other, you know, authoritative religious book was written by one person in one specific period of time. The Bible was written by 40 different authors over a span of 1,500 years in three different languages. And so there's not one person that sit down and said, let's try to debrief God. Let's try to write theology, you know, right now. No, this is a collection, a compilation of books. Yet, what's amazing is that it has a consistent story. And we're going to go through that story in just a minute. But uh, before we go to this story, before we care about this story, there may be some questions I'm guessing. One of the questions that you may have is this. Is the text of the New Testament reliable? In other words, can I trust the New Testament when I read it? And, and the may, the maybe the first question related to that may be, what about errors in translation? Right? We know that the Bible wasn't written in English. So what happens when you, know, you go from one language to the other? Well, the reality is that you know, the text in its original language is available online for free. And there are many books that you can get for free. You can Greek, get a Greek New Testament easily in, a, in book form or online. By the way, if you've never visited BibleHub.com, it's an excellent source. It's, it's free. You can see what is called interlinear. And you see the Greek or Hebrew text, and then you see the translation right underneath, word by word, if you want it that way. Now, the reason why there are different translations is because some people have decided that they want to keep the structure of the text, so word by word, as much as possible. And so they'll sound a certain way. In another translation, they want the thoughts to be translated. And so they go thought by thought, and it sounds a little different. But I want you to know you don't have to worry about, you know, the accuracy because most of the time, uh, since I come from Mexico and I know two different languages, um, I understand that there are variances and differences. And it doesn't mean that the meaning of whatever you're trying to say has changed. For example, in English we have this idiom called, you know, that, that you say, man, you're driving me crazy, like right now. Well, if I were to translate word by word that into Spanish, it would make no sense. It's like... You are physically driving me to a place called crazy. And that just wouldn't make any sense, right? And so what you do is you change and you say another idiom that replaces that. Now, I'm not doing it word by word. Does that mean that I'm losing its meaning? No, I'm actually preserving the meaning. That's what translators do. And so this is why translation should not be an issue in your mind. We have many tools to understand the New Testament's original meaning. There are lexicons and dictionaries and cultural books that help you understand the culture that, that, that was receiving these texts. And no major doctrine is changed by any translation ambiguity. So you can rest assured that whatever translation you have is probably keeping, it's, it's, I mean, not probably, it's keeping the, the meaning of the text of major doctrines. You don't have to worry about that. How many of you have at least one Bible at home? Just raise your hand. Everybody. Okay, how many of you have at least two different translations at home? Most people. Good job. How many of you have, let's just say, ten Bibles? There is still a few of you. Wow. You're Bible collectors over here. I hope you're reading them, okay, as much as you're collecting them. Here's, here's the next thing that I want you to, to think about. Maybe another question that we may have is, how can we know that the Bible today is a reliable record of the original writings? So let's say that we get past the issue of translation. Now we need to remember that we don't have the actual original texts that were written. 
What we have are called, there are copies of the scripture, they're called manuscripts. The reason why they're called manuscripts is because they're handwritten copies. That's all it means. Manuscript means a handwritten copy. And we have handwritten copies of the originals. Now, when you think about that, you may, you know, a lot of the claims that are made online is, well, since there have been so many years, it's been, cha- you know, the, the, the original text, maybe they were from God, but what we have now isn't. Because every time you copy it, you know, it changes. And maybe we, you know, it's been a long period of time from the original to what we have now, so we don't know what happened in between them. Well, here's, here's a, a graph uh, table just to give you an idea of other ancient texts that we study and know about. Uh, Plato's Tetralogies. We have about 210, some people say 230 manuscripts that have been discovered. That means copies. But the span of time between the, when the originals were written and the earliest copies that we have is about 1,200 years. Okay, and then you have Caesar's Gallic Wars. You know, we have about 250 manuscripts in the span between the earliest manuscript in the original is about a thousand years. Then you have Homer Iliad, and we have a lot more, a lot more copies, about 1,800 manuscripts. And the period between the time span between the, the original and the earliest copy is 500. And this is when you start getting an idea of the vastness and the richness of the copies of the New Testament that we have, because the New Testament has. 5,800 manuscripts or copies in Greek alone, so the original language, plus we have about 19,000 in different languages like Coptic, Latin, Syriac, and, and, and the span between the earliest copies, and there's about 19 of them, and the, the originals are only, it's only 80 years. And so, so here's the question that, that we need to start asking, you know, when people raise, you know, some of these uh, Maybe this criticism about the Bible is, you know, how do we know if we don't believe that the text that we have now is in, you know, somewhat accurate copy of the originals, then we shouldn't believe anything about any other ancient text because really the Bible is as good as it gets in terms of reliability of the text. But maybe for some of us, we may have um, other questions. Okay, we may have questions about variances. What happens when, you know, there are different, little differences in the text? It's like, how can you trust this when it was written, when it was copied by humans, right? And so you picture the scribe or someone, you know, doing a copy. They didn't have phones back there, so they couldn't get distracted by Facebook or anything else. But maybe their tea was running over, the water was boiling, and they put the pen down, and they go pour themselves some tea. They come back. And they pick up on line four instead of line three, right? They just missed something. Or they picked up on the wrong word and they just missed, you know, something or added a word or something happened. And we do find differences in the New Testament. To give you an idea, there are, um, the other one, please, back, uh, 138,162 words in the New Testament. And we have 400,000 variants or differences between the copies. You're like, that's a whole lot. That sounds like a whole lot. And, and it does. It's like three variances per word in the New Testament. You're like, whoa, what's going on here? Until you realize that we have almost 25,000 copies. That means that each copy may have, you know, about 16 variances per copy, per copy on average. So that means that really when you sit down and see how large the New Testament is or a book of the New Testament, there may be only 16 variances. Now for some of you, you're like, you were thinking that, you know, the Bible, I don't know maybe what your thoughts about the Bible are. You may still think a lot of these variances, you know, 16 is even a lot, you know, per book or per New Testament copy. But here's what I want you to know. There are variances are put in four different categories. Here's the first one. Um... Spelling and nonsense errors. In fact, I, I'm going to give it to you in the, in the order of the ones that we have the most of to the ones that we have the least of. So the vast majority of variances are simply spelling variances or differences and nonsense errors. So like in English, we, you know, we use an N right before another word, you know, in front of the, wo- the word A and before another word that starts with a vowel. And so in this case, you know, instead of saying an apple, 
someone wrote a apple. Well, the word new, which is the 13th Greek letter, actually causes a lot of misspellings in Greek. And just like there are some like C and S in English, or sometimes whether we put one or two word letters of the same, you know, the same kind in, in a word, and we may probably, we, we have a lot of misspellings. In Greek, the, the new letter, that's the letter N in Greek, causes a lot of misspellings. And since people, you know, just uh, weren't as literate as really we are and as consistent, you know, they misspelled it just like we would now. Now that we have these devices, I bet there's a lot more misspellings happening. And in the future, there may be even more because we don't pay attention to that. It's corrected to us. And so that's a vast majority of the variants. Just nonsense errors, spellings that are easy to tell. Now, for example, there is another category, synonyms and irrelevant minor changes. Like sometimes people add it in Greek, and this goes for Spanish as well. You add an article, you, you add an article before a proper name, like the Barnabas instead of Barnabas. And some people add it, some people don't. But that's just it. It doesn't change anything. Or the form of a sentence, like Jesus loves John versus John is loved by Jesus. But again, is it changing the meaning? It's not at all. Most of the variants are in, in these two categories. And then there's, there are two more categories that have very few, about 5% of the rest. So meaningful but not viable. So that means that, for example, in this phrase, the gospel of God versus the gospel of Christ. Now, we know that Christ is God and, and you know, are the same in the Trinity, but they're two different persons of the Trinity. So that is meaningful. That means it changes the meaning of the text. But it's not viable in the sense that you're going to find out as you look at all the copies, and we have over 20,000, you know, you're going to find the oldest is going to say either God or Christ. And so what translators do, what I mean what uh, scholars do is they take the oldest translations and the one that have the most agreement, and they go with that one. And so if it's God, it's God. If it's Christ, it's Christ. And then there is the last category, which is very minimal. Uh, in fact, there are only... I would say a handful of passages. I have this. Uh, and all of those, by the way, are marked on your Bible. So you're, it's not like you're going to miss it. It's going to tell you there, hey, this passage, you know, here's what the oldest manuscript says. And, and it's one of these uh, meaningful and viable uh, variances. And like in this word, echo men, means we have peace. If you add that little dash on top of the O, means let us have peace. If you don't add it, it means we have peace. Now, this is meaningful because if you say we have peace, you're, say, you're saying we already have peace. But if you say let us have peace, you're saying I'm going to encourage you. I, I encourage you to get this peace from the Lord. And so it's meaningful and, you know, it changes the meaning, but also is viable because it could be either or. And there's only two large passages that, that have this type of uh, variant. Mark 16, the end of Mark, and John 7, 53 through John uh, 8, 11. And there are, there are only two. Now, I want you to know this because sometimes it can be scary as a Christian. And if you don't know anything about this, it's like, oh, I didn't know, you know this happened. But the issue of variance is really relieved by the number of copies. It's outweighed by the number of copies that we have. When you think about all the copies that we have, it's so easy to tell which one was edited later and which one the, the actual manuscripts the, the were you know, copied early on had. Let's, let me give you an example. I want you to spot all the variances. Imagine, by the way, if you don't know what this is, this is our St. Charles campus address. And I want you to spot all the variances that you can here. And I'm just going to give you 10 seconds. How many did you spot? Five? How many? Okay, some five, some six, I think I heard. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Here are all the, the, the variants, right? And over there it said St. Peter's instead of St. Charles, but the rest is St. Charles, so we know it's St. Charles. Over here it said uh, instead of kings, it's zinks, so we know that's the only one, you know, and also the zip code was different, you know, because uh, this is actually, I think, Florissant's zip code. Uh, then here, the, the, the address was wrong. The address number was wrong. Here, 
you know, again, this would be a variant that's not relevant because we know the ST is saint, and we know the crossing, sometimes people can, can put it this way, so nothing to worry about. Here, there is an actual difference. It's not kings, it's queens, and here they left out Missouri. Now, you read any of these four cards, would you be concerned and say, you know, that address doesn't exist. It's impossible to get there. Like, no, you wouldn't. You would say, there's an original address, and from these, we can tell that it's 2950 Kings Crossing, St. Charles, Missouri, 63303. Because all between all of them, the number of copies that we had was enough to tell you which one was wrong and, and how you could do it. Well, when you multiply that and you say, we have over 20,000 copies of Scripture, that's how we can tell what the original was. And so there is no, no problem. And so here's what... I want you to know that there is a text purity of 99.5%, you know, in Scripture. And that is very, very high, higher than any other ancient text that we have. And so if you trust any other type of ancient text, you should trust, you can trust the reliability of Scripture. God, the Scriptures originated in God. But here's the big story. We believe the Bible is a revelation of God that originated in God, but it's a revelation about Jesus or of Jesus. In Luke 24, 27, after Jesus raises from the dead, he is walking along with these two men that are going back from Jerusalem to their hometown. And these men, you know, find Jesus. They don't recognize him because they expect, you know, they saw Jesus die on the cross. They don't recognize him. And he's walking along. He's like, what's going on? And they're like, are you the only person in Jerusalem that doesn't know what's happened? That, that the teachers of the law killed Jesus, and he was a prophet, and we thought he was the Messiah. And so here's what Jesus says in Luke 24, 27. He says, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And then he keeps going and does the same with the apostles. Verse 45, 44 says, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. So in other words, the Old Testament points to Jesus. And we see then the New Testament telling what Jesus did. And it's all one story that leads to the work of Jesus on the cross through his death and then through his resurrection. And then setting up his kingdom. So we believe the Bible is a revelation of Jesus. Uh, Pastor Nicomas uh, put it this way. He said, the Old Testament is, anticipates Jesus. The gospel manifests Jesus. Acts proclaims Jesus. The letters of Paul explain Jesus. And Revelation consummates the story of Jesus. And it just brings it all back together. So we believe the Bible is a revelation of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Here's the other thing we believe about the Bible. The Bible is used by the Holy Spirit to transform us. The Bible is used by the Holy Spirit to transform us. Jesus said in John chapter 16, he's like, I have much more to say. It's like Jesus is getting ready to go to the cross and he tells his disciples, man, I have so much to tell you, but you're not ready to hear some of that. And then verse 13, he says, but when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. The Holy Spirit was still yet to reveal the New Testament, and then he was going to help us and lead us to all truth. Now, when it comes to this, I find people in two different camps. Some people lean into the Holy Spirit and neglect the Scriptures. In other words, it's like when you become a Christian, you just want to know, you want the Holy Spirit to reveal to you, but you never get into the Scriptures. And I'm going to tell you, you know, that, that can be dangerous because if you don't know the Scriptures, you won't know what God sounds like. You don't know to recognize between your voice and the voice of God or between your voice and the voice of the, en- the enemy. And so what we need to do is we need to get in the Scriptures Know what God sounds like, know his character, know how he works, and then you'll be able to distinguish that. Amen. Some people, however, go the other extreme. They rely, they lean into the scriptures and forget or neglect the Holy Spirit. In other words, they try to fit everything into system and doctrines and, and belief systems. 
is where all the isms of Christianity come in, right? Like premillennialism, amillennialism, Calvinism, Arminianism, complementarianism. I mean, all the isms is when you lean away from the Spirit and you just want to put everything into a neatly categorized system. You know, for those of you who love reading, maybe you love a novel or science fiction, you know, what would you do if you had access to the author? If you could just sit down and talk about your favorite book with the author. You know that for Christians, we have that option, that you can go to the Lord and ask, Lord, what were you thinking when, when you were, you know, giving us this piece of scripture? What do you want me to learn? You know, don't just read it to see how you can refute the next, you know, skeptical. Don't read it because you want to prove someone wrong. Don't read it because you want to check it off your mark. But when we get into God's word, lean into it, but lean into the spirit. Ask the Holy Spirit, what is that you want me to learn? Transform me. Soften my heart before I read it. Lead me to all truth. So, so here's, let's go to the practical uh, part of it. If the Bible is the inspired word of God, the first thing you need to do is simply accept it. You accept it. 2 Timothy 3 says this. Uh, all scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So if you believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God, accept it. Now I can tell you, hey, you may be here, you may still have questions. You know, I have such limited amount of time to talk about such a vast amount of material. You may be thinking, I still have questions, that's fine. You can keep looking. You can even reject it. If you don't want to accept it, you don't have to accept it, you can reject it. But here's the problem. I don't think that we get to choose what we like and what we don't like. You don't get to choose parts of scripture and reject the rest. So if you accept it, just read it as God's word. If you reject it, then I encourage you, why am I rejecting it as God's word? But if you accept it, then you don't get to choose it. You don't get to choose the passages that you like, that, you know, talk about God's love for you and reject the ones that are a little uncomfortable, right? That talk about maybe judgment and repentance or the ones that talk about, you know, in the Old Testament, there are some tough passages for our culture of things that God, you know, God said, and we don't want to talk about it. We just kind of minimize those. It's like, I just want to, you know, stay on these passages that I like. We have to accept it as a whole. And you have to learn to study it. Here's the next thing. Read the Bible alone. Read the Bible alone. Second Timothy, uh, just right there where you were, 4.13. It's toward the end of this, this book called Second Timothy. The Apostle Paul says this. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas, Troas and my scrolls, especially the parchments. Now, you're thinking, okay, so what does this passage mean? Well, the Apostle Paul, this is the last letter that he wrote, 2 Timothy. After this, he would become a martyr and, and be beheaded because of the name of Jesus. We don't know how long after, but he, he sensed that his time was getting close. And he's, he's talking to Timothy, and he's like, I want you to come see me. He says, and by the way, when you come, don't forget the scriptures. Don't forget the scrolls, the parchments. Now, if you think about who the Apostle Paul was, I mean, this is a guy that wrote a third of the New Testament, okay? He's like, if anyone knew theology and if anyone knew the scriptures was Paul, yet you have an older seasoned Paul still wanting to say, man, I just want to read the scriptures. I don't want to ever stop. You know, some of us, I don't know how many of you have read the Bible from, you know, beginning to end, but I'm going to tell you, if you haven't done it, you can do it. You just have to be a little disciplined about it. You have to read it consistently, and you have to read it methodically. In other words, don't go like I was telling you earlier, right? Sometimes we use the Bible as a pill. You go and get the pill for your anxiety today and for depression tomorrow and for whatever is going on, worry the next day. No, read it consistently and methodically. You don't have to read a whole lot, but start with something and read it alone. Read the actual Bible, okay? Don't keep listening to endless YouTube videos and podcasts that are regurgitating the Bible for you. Right? Have you ever seen those little birds that get fed by mama bird? It's like mama bird goes and gets a little something and then, you know, puts it back in their mouth. Now, can you think about how nasty that is if we think about it in human terms? 
That'd be gross, right? It's like, come on, mom, I don't want that. But that's exactly what we do with scripture sometimes. We let everybody else think about it. It's like, you think about it, and, and then tell me what you think. And we just get that. And if that's the only thing that you get from scripture, I'm going to tell you, you're going to be in that nest, and you're not going to be able to grow well. And so what, we, what happens to these birds is they, they can do that for a while. And if you are new, there is nothing wrong. You're just learning, right? So there's a time to do that. But eventually, guess what happens? These little birds get wings, and then they fly, and they get their own worm, and then they feed themselves. And if you're a Christian, I hope that you're growing those wings, and eventually you start just being disciplined and reading the Bible alone, consistently and methodically, one book at a time, and you mark it. So, okay, I'm going to read this book, and I'm going to mark it. And then the next one, start with the New Testament, and read it all, all the way. And then maybe you can move into the Old Testament, and then start reading it. And there are many tools along the way for you, but make sure that you're reading the Bible, not just listening to someone else's reading of it. Um, I don't want to be your authority, for, for sure. And I don't think anyone else should be your authority. It should be the Bible alone. And here's the last thing. Do it. You accept it. You read the Bible alone, and then you do it. If you don't do it, then you're reading for nothing. The Lord Jesus said, those who listen to my words and do them are like a man who built his house on the rock. And when the storms, storms came and beat against the house, it was able to withstand the storms. If you want, but, but he says, but those who listen to my words, so they know it, they read them, and don't do them, are like the man who built his house on the sand, and when the storms came and beat the house, it crashed and he suffered great loss. We need to learn to do it. I'm holding the, here a banner that was a delivery system from the Air Force during times of World War II. And what this, how this banner was used is when there was a live battle, so this is like, you know, lifetime, and there were some... Uh, orders that needed to be delivered, a plane uh, would fly as close to the ground as he could, where he could be seen by the soldiers, and he would just do a one fly by, and they would just throw this out of the plane and just let it land. And the soldiers and the people that, you know, understood what this was, they would go, they would grab it. Here's what it said, mail or deliver to nearest Army Air Force's troops. And they would go deliver it, and it would have, you know, just maybe advice or new information that they needed in order to get an advantage in the battle. And I tell you, over the last 15, you know, over the last 2,000 years, we have had a set of 66 of these right here. God has given us so many because He can see the whole picture. He has all the information that He needs, and He, he gave it to us for us to be able to get an advantage on this battle we call life. Now, you can take it and receive it. You can open it and you can read it. But the most important thing is that you learn to do what it says. And the one thing that I do want you to know is that you can even reject it. You can say, you know what, I don't, I don't believe this. But what you cannot do is say that you trust it and ignore it. You have to make a decision. We believe the Bible is the inspired word of God and absolute in its authority here at Harvester. And I hope that you let the Trinity, God, Son, and the Holy Spirit, use it to abide in you and transform you. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. You have, uh, Lord, uh, given us words of wisdom, words of life. You have told us about your character, about who you are. And Lord, it all points to the Lord Jesus in his work and i pray lord as we look at the work of your son and that we can receive him that we can receive the life that he brings with him and lord that you would use your word and, and transform our lives through your holy spirit and lord it's in your son's name in jesus name that we pray amen